Ladies and gentlemen, the salvation of all, the truth that the cross will reach every son and daughter of Adam and bring them out eventually from death and condemnation and sin. As great as that truth is, that truth is not the gospel. It is, if I can say it this way, a result of the gospel. I know many people who, and this is important, who emphasize the salvation of all. It's like it's their pet thing, which I'm not disparaging that. That information needs to get out there, and that will probably lead people to want to know more about Christ. But the announcement of the salvation of all is not the same as the announcement of the evangel of the grace of God. Again, the evangel of the grace of God will result in the salvation of all. As proof of this, I know many people who believe in the salvation of all, and this is possible to do, you can believe in the salvation of all without knowing anything about the gospel. You're believing in a result without touching the cause. You're looking at the effect and not the cause. Maybe that's a better way to say that. The cause is the most important element. We can teach on the salvation of all, all day. It's a great truth, but again, it doesn't, it may lead to saving faith, but it itself is not saving faith. Because nobody know how we nobody knows if you just say that how we got there. Now it's important whenever we announce the salvation of all that we base it on the cross of Christ. That this thing does not come about because humanity is too good to be separated from God for eternity. That would be the tenet of universalism. We don't herald that truth because God is too good to send anyone to an eternity of torment or to annihilate them, which would be a tenet of Unitarians. Because we are neither universalists nor Unitarians. And don't ever let anybody saddle you with that handle. Oh, I hear you're a universalist. The first thing you need to say is, no, I'm not. Or you could say, excuse me, have I ever called you a name? I like that one myself. You're not a Unitarian. What are you? Well, you believe in the effectiveness of Jesus, Christ, of Jesus Christ's work on the cross to eliminate sin. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. I believe he was successful. That's what I am. That's what I believe. Another way to put it more succinctly would be, I believe that Jesus Christ is greater than Adam. What do you guys believe? Uh, we believe a crazy thing. Well, what is it? Jesus Christ is greater than Adam. Oh, yeah, I believe that too. Really? Do you believe in the salvation of all? No. Well, then you don't believe Jesus Christ was greater than Adam. Adam condemned the entire race. Jesus Christ does not extract that same race. Romans 5, 18 and 19 says he does. It's a denial of the power of the cross. So what is the gospel? Well, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is the best presentation of it. And I'm going to tell you the best way, after you read this verse, the best way to present it. We must not ever present the evangel as a challenge to the human. We must not present it as an if-then proposition. We must not ever hearken back to the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses, the Old Covenant, as we've been talking about. 1 Corinthians 15, chapter 1, uh, I'm sorry, verse 1, Paul says, Now I am making known to you, brethren, the evangel which I bring to you, which also you accepted, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you are retaining what I said, and bring the evangel to you outside, and accept you believe feignedly. See, the retaining of it is proof that you actually received it. This is interesting because if you hear it, if you hear what Paul's about to announce, and if, if you 
really believe it, you'll retain it. But if it slips away quickly and you're quickly shaken from it, then it's questionable whether you ever, ever believed it in the first place or not. Now, it is possible that you can receive it and you've got it, and then you can be dissuaded temporarily from it. I suppose that that is possible. There's two ways you can lose it. Uh, there's only one way you can lose it. You can lose it if you never had it. I guess once you have it, you can't lose it. Let's put it that Once you have it, you can't lose this evangel. But there, it could be evidence that you really never had it in the first place. And that would be if you don't retain it. It slips away. It's like, where did that go? You were all gung-ho about it, and then you just kind of got distracted, went off on another path, started believing other weird stuff like New Age stuff. Well, you never really believed it then. You're a feigned believer. Anyway, here is the announcement of the evangel. I give over to you among the first, this is verse 3, 1 Corinthians 15, what also I accepted, that Christ died for our sins. He died for a purpose. He actually died. He didn't go on living in another form. He died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was entombed. In case you don't realize what death is, he was entombed, not his body. He, Jesus Christ, was entombed. Paul just adds that, a little flavor there. Uh, just to say that, in case you don't know what death is, he was entombed. He died and he didn't go to heaven. He was entombed and he has been roused the third day according to the scriptures. Christ died for our sins. You don't read anything there about he's the savior of all humanity. That comes later in this chapter. Paul gets into that in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 21. Talking about, in fact, through a human came death through a human also comes the resurrection of the dead even as an animal are dying now we're getting to the salvation of all thus also in christ shall all be vivified yet each in his own class glorious truths here in first corinthians chapter 15 one of my favorite chapters of scripture so how do we pre present not prevent many people prevent the evangel but how do we present the evangel you present it as god through christ and christ alone through the death of christ is now conciliated to the world not reckoning your offenses to them this will shock anyone you tell it to and again th this is a nice way to lead to the salvation of all eventually but again the salvation of all is technically not the gospel because you can believe in the salvation of all without even believing this message what i just read you christ died you need we need to announce the source we need to announce the the cause then we can begin unrolling for people unraveling the glorious effects of the evangel i want you to herald the cause herald christ and this is the most direct relief that people are going to get when you tell them this they're going to be relieved to hear this in verse 18 of second corinthians 5 yet all is of god who conciliates us to himself through christ conciliate this through christ this relates it right back to first corinthians 15 starting uh, with verse 1, 1 through 4. He conciliates us to himself through Christ and is giving us the dispensation, that is, the giving away of the conciliation. What conciliation? This thing that happened at the cross. Explain it more in more detail, Martin. Okay, I'll let Paul do it in verse 19. How that God was in Christ... God was doing it in his son, conciliating the world, not just us, not just believers, conciliating the world to himself. Here's the shocker, not reckoning their offenses to them and placing in us the word of the conciliation. You give them the one-two punch. You give them, you don't give them the salvation of all. That's not the evangel. It's great, but this is where you start. Christ on the cross. Christ died for something, for sins. And he was entombed, which proves that he died. 
and he was raised from the dead. You can't be raised from the dead unless you're dead. So therefore, the Trinity screws all that up. The Trinity is a roadblock to this truth. Free will is a roadblock to this truth because free will says that you are delivered from your sins by a personal decision. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, 1 through 4, Christ died for sin. So free will blows it up. The Trinity blows it up. That's why I hate those two teachings. That's why, that's why they're satanic in nature because they keep people from believing in Jesus Christ. Now, the result of this work of Christ is that Christ has now conciliated you. They don't hear that. People don't hear that message. Anybody, If anybody has any familiarity with church or so-called evangelist, the way they present it, you can go to the, to the how-to list of modern-day evangelism, how to be an evangelist. Uh, and for my first recommendation was if you want to be an evangelist, learn what the evangelist is. Ah, that would be... That would be first, but not many people do that. So this is very rare what you're hearing here. In their list of things to do, you must convict people of their sins. You are a sinner bound for hell. That's your default setting subsequent to the sacrifice of Christ for your sins. How can that be? Simply this, the sacrifice of Christ for your sins didn't work. Oops, it didn't work. You have to do it. So people are convicted, convicted, convicted. Uh, falsely, wrongly, maliciously, stupidly, ignorantly. This, God is at peace with you. Jesus Christ took away your sins at the cross. Now I know for a fact that everyone has eternal life. Not everyone has Aeonian life. We don't know who has Aeonian life. There's that tricky little translation where the word translated eternal in the modern versions has been mistranslated. You can find this out in any concordance. Translated eternal, it's the Greek word ionios. It means aeonian, having to do with eons, having to do with time. That's a word. It's in the dictionary. Look it up. E-O-N-I-A-N, -I -I -N, aeonian. It's in the dictionary, the English dictionary, having to do with eons. It's an adjective. Anyway... You present to people, God's at peace with you. Well, wait a minute. Don't I have to make a decision for that to happen? No. Wait a minute. It's just... How could it be? Because of Christ. Because God was conciliated to the world through Christ. And now he's now smiling on you. All... Some crazy bird just landed outside the car. I want to, oh, there he goes. I was going to show him to you here. You tell people that all enmity, all upsetness, all strife, all anger is on your side of the clouds here. God's the sunshine. He's smiling on you. And the only reason you feel like crap, sir or madam, is because you have been led to believe, you've been misled by people telling you that God is angry at you. He's an angry God. He's an angry God. He's a vindictive God. And you have to hurry up and like him before you die. Or he has no choice but to send you to an eternity of torment. That's not the gospel. They think that's the gospel. Oh, my God. That is so not the gospel. That is a threat with God's name illicitly put on it. Here's a crazy bird over here. This bird's, when you see this thing. You see that crazy? It's a duck or something. It's an ugly duck. You see that thing? All right. So imagine the delight when people hear that God is, is conciliated. Conciliation means peace. God is at peace. God is so relaxed, so calm concerning the world because of Christ. Now, if somebody receives that truth, if they accept that, then boom, they have Aeonian life. But you're not challenging them to believe in God or die. You're telling them you're, you're taken care of. You have eternal life. Christ died for the sake of all humanity. But I want you to know personally, sir or madam, that God is at peace with you. That's what conciliation is. It's one way peace from God's side to the human side. When the human receives this truth, and goes, yes, then it becomes mutual, 
and we call it reconciliation. That person then comes becomes reconciled to God because as they stand, they're probably not reconciled to God. They're probably pissed off at God because of having grown up in a church or a religion. You're telling them that their sins have been taken care of. And then you say, they say, well, what should I, I do? And we say, believe it. Now, we know they can't believe it unless God causes them to believe it. But their, their belief brings them into, I'll get more into this tomorrow. I was going to do it today, but I didn't have a problem because I'm busy trying to show you cool birds in the parking lot here of the shopping mall, shopping center. That was a mistake, me trying to show you the birds. Uh, they, they, they've never heard anything like this. And you, you don't present it again as a challenge you present it as something that has been finished by Christ and then when they receive it then they come into aeonian life they be they be they come into a knowledge of it and then that's the spark that brings them into a life that endures for the eon so they're not at that point they're not just saved for eternity and if they don't believe it if they say well I just don't believe that then you just shrug and say well I told you the truth and you say, you have to admit, you don't hear this at church. And they'll say, no, don't hear that at church. That God is smiling on you. He's not challenging you. He's not mad at you. He's not waiting for you. He doesn't hope you perform for him so that he can save you. No, they don't hear that. They don't. They don't hear that. But now they're going to hear it because we're heralds. I just don't want you to start on the wrong foot and think that the salvation of all is everything. It's a great, it's definitely the fruit of Christ's work. And if somebody starts becoming interested in that topic, it's a good way to get somebody interested because most of the world has been turned away from God because of that freaking teaching. So if you tell them that's not true, that's a good way. But don't, you can't stop there. It's a good way to introduce them to the Christ who did that. How would you like to meet the Christ who did that? How do I do that? How do I meet that Christ? And what did he do for me? You're telling me he saved the whole world. I like this Christ. I like this. I, nobody's ever told me that. That sounds good. It makes sense to me that Christ would save the world, not just a few people. But then they'll need to know, and you need to introduce, what does that mean for me personally? What does that mean for you, for them? them? And then you explain to them that Christ accomplished it on the cross. It wasn't because God's wasn't because God's just a nice guy that he saved everybody. It's not because the humanity's just too good to send to eternal death. That's not the reason why God's the savior of all humanity. It's because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And what he did on the cross was he took away the sins of the world and he has conciliated the world to himself. This is our announcement. This is our message. And it's the only thing that will bring peace finally to those who are hearing you.